Now I would like to um, introduce our fourth speaker of the day, um, Dr. Charles Simpson. Um, Dr. Simpson is a professor emeritus of Texas A&M AgriLife Research Center um, at Stephenville, Texas, and has been the project leader of the Peanut Wild Species Program there since 1967, and continues in that position as he is semi-retired. He has developed several pathways for gene integration. He and colleagues released the first peanut cultivars with genes introduced into those cultivars from wild arrakis. The most significant of these was the transfer of resistance to root knot nematodes into cultivated peanut. He has been the leader or co-leader and has participated on 28 expeditions to collect cultivated and wild arrakis germplasm in South America. The teams have collected more than 1,800 accessions of wild peanut, including more than 75 new species of arrakis, more than 5,000 cultivated land races, and more than 500 accessions of rhizobia. Simpson um, entered Texas A&M University in 1960, where, when he earned his BS in egg education in 1963. He received a NDEA graduate fellowship um, to earn his master's in 1966 and his PhD in 1967 in plant breeding and cytogenetics from Texas A&M. From the very beginning, he has been involved in the biodiversity of the genus Arrakis. Simpson was promoted to full professor in 1984, and in 1979, he was appointed to the graduate faculty of Texas A&M University and has been author or co-author on 20 peanut variety releases and registrations with crop science. He has served on the crop registration subcommittee for peanuts for more than 30 years. He received the Meyer Medal in 1993 for his work on collection, maintenance, distribution, and utilization of arachis germplasm. And in 2015, he was selected to present the Kelvin Sperling Memorial Lecture on Biodiversity at the ASA Tri-Societies meetings. Um, Dr. Charles Simpson was, is co-author um, or author on a total of 124 refereed journal articles, author or co-author on a 14 book chapters, and co-translated the peanut monograph from Spanish to English. The title of his presentation today is Collecting, Preserving, and Utilizing Genetic Diversity in Arrakis. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Simpson. Th thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, thank the uh, committee for uh, selecting me to, to be here to present uh, to you about my favorite subject, Arrakis. And uh, the award this morning was a total surprise. Obviously, my wife and daughter knew about it, but <laughs> I didn't. But uh, uh, I, I greatly appreciate that. It's a, it's a real honor. Uh, the, the, the peanut uh, is, uh, the, the cultivated peanut is a young species of, for cultivated crops. It's, it's only about 3,500 years old. And when I went to work in 67, they told me that, everyone told me it has a very narrow genetic base. And so I, I immediately started looking for variability. And uh, this, this presentation is to that end. Uh, just a, the outline is like the title. The genus Arrakis, originated somewhere here in this zone in southwest Brazil, northeast Paraguay, sometime after a mid-tertiary uplift of the old Brazilian shield, the Brazilian shield, uh, sometime in that, in that time frame, a long time ago. Uh, we still see the eroded mains, remains of that uplift in that region today, and in that region we also find the two most morphologically primitive species. You see they, this, this species, Arrakis guarnetica, only has three leaflets. And the other tuberosa, it also only has three leaflets. The, uh, the common thing for the, the cultivated peanut and all the other wild species is four leaflets. And the most unique thing is about the fruit 
the ovule is here at the in the leaf axle. The, fl the flower stalk uh, grows every morning up, up from the from the inflorescence in the leaf axis. Uh, after fertilization, the embryo divides about three or four times and then becomes quiescent, and a, a meristem begins to uh, divide at the base of the ovule, and it it's, uh, grows this peg, which is uh, ge geotropically positive. Uh, it will grow into the soil when it uh, when it reaches a depth into the soil where it's dark, then it stops growing, and the peanut forms. Uh, the flower is a typical palpinaceous flower, and here I have removed the calyx bracts, but typical palpinaceous flower with a with a standard petal, two wings, a keel, and inside the keel, the, the anthers and the stigma. Uh, the, the geocarpic fruit of the wild species uh, is biarticulate in most, uh, has an isthmus between the uh, two segments of the, of the pod, and when that first one, the basal one, is uh, physiologically mature enough that it will probably survive if, if a separated from the plant, then a, a second isthmus grows to grow a second pod, and in one section it, it actually makes a third. Uh, the, this uh, Cardinaceae, uh, the, same, the same thing for it. Uh, these two uh, I'll mention quite a bit later, uh, quite a bit in the, in the later part of the presentation. They are diploids, and most, most of the wild species are diploids. The cultivated is a tetraploid with 40 chromosomes. Uh, the, the genus from that or origin was distributed uh, over the continent, uh, by, mostly by running water because the, the, uh, the fruit were underground. And it's, it's easy to see that. Uh, this is the Paraguay River. But at flood stage, these loops, and we often find uh, wild peanuts growing in those loops uh, during the dry season, not during the wet season, but during the dry season. And this is the Rio, uh, Rio Grande in uh, southeast Bolivia. And again, we've, we've collected wild peanuts in these uh, sandbars uh, during the dry season. And we were crossing the Malmaray River in western Brazil, and a, an island came floating by that was actually larger than the boat we were in. There may well have been a peanut there, but we didn't. We tried to avoid that because we, we might have gone under, and that was about 30 meters of water. Uh, we actually have seen uh, wild peanut seedlings uh, growing in driftwood like this, so it's obvious that that we are somewhat correct, at least, that uh, the water moves them around quite a bit. The range of the wild species uh, is from the dry northeast part of Brazil, that is uh, almost desert conditions much of the year, up to the mouth of the Amazon. There's an island in the mouth of the Amazon, and a wild peanut grows there on that island. It came from Santa Cruz, Bolivia, here. Uh, then now north to northern Bolivia, south to uh, Santa Cruz, then on to north uh, east northwest Argentina, uh, down to Uruguay, back up. This area is where we find the wild peanuts. Uh, from the from the coastline, uh, the the, uh, the species are found from that to. The dry northeast, and I mean really dry, uh, westward into the Pantanal, a, a large swamp, and then to uh, uh, the eastern slopes of the Cordillera, the Andes. We collected uh, this this species, uh, Batizacoy, and that, and Batizacoy was a big part of our program that I'll mention some more later. Uh, these three men were the kind of the pioneers of the uh, collection work, the modern collection work. Uh, Dr. Walter Gregory from NC State University, Jose Pietarelli from Argentina, uh, an agronomist, and Dr. Antonio Krapovicus, a, a botanist from Argentina. All three of these men are deceased, but they were they were my mentors and got 
got me involved in the wild species collection work. Uh, about in the, in the early to mid 60s, this became a very common sight, especially in Brazil, but also in other places. Uh, pushing down the forest, pushing it into windrows, burning it, and uh, making cultivated land in between. And when they did this, very likely they were going to destroy the, the populations of wild species. And this, this became a concern. And uh, the chainsaw and the bulldozer uh, left this kind of thing. And when they uh, went to uh, grassland like this, the brachiaria, some of the wild species could survive in that. And we have found them growing around the edges. But for the most part, that pretty well takes out the population. Then when they go to this, go to the sugar cane, and especially when they go to uh, the soybean fields and you start using the herbicides, the wild species of rachis are gone. And we see this commonly around the soybean fields, a wild arachis trying to survive in the, in the edge of the, of the field, but the herbicides are just too much for it. So, uh, and, and then in Argentina, they actually built a refiner, oil refinery on one of the populations. When we were there in 77, the, the, the population was still there, but uh, it was suffering. Uh, in, in the early uh, 70s, the International Board for Plant Genetic Resources was formed. In 75, Gregory and Krapovicus uh, submitted a proposal, three-year proposal, to collect in these uh, countries listed here and invited me to, to get involved with them. These were the areas that uh, they proposed on the first proposal to collect. And uh, the first expedition was to the Western Mato Grosso specifically on that expedition to try to find Arrakis diogoi. Arrakis diogoi was collected many uh, decades before, but it was, there was a lot of confusion, and, and so that, that was one of the goals. The, uh, I was not able to go on that first expedition, but they found it very quickly, and so they continued continued then in the uh, in, in uh, uh, southwest Brazil and actually collected three new species on that trip. Uh, the Arrakis diagoi was growing on the, on the banks of the Lagoa Gaiba in the western uh, part of the, the Pantanal in Brazil. And uh, then the, the uh, the expeditions that followed in 77, 8, 9, and in uh, uh, 1980 uh, were to, the idea was to collect both cultivated and wild. In 1977 and 80, two teams went to uh, Bolivia, uh, one to the mountains and the other to the Selva, to the mountain team to collect cultivated, and the, the team I was with to the Selva to collect wild species. Um, that first expedition, uh, this is the outline of where we are, won't spend a lot of time here, but uh, we collected four new species in 77. 79, uh, airstrip hopping, we uh, collected one new species. There was a, a lot of flooding at that time and everything was inundated, so we, uh, we were planned to be there two months and, and we uh, canceled out after a month. Then in 1980, uh, this was the area we collected. Uh, again, the hair strip hopping a little bit and uh, four new species. And then uh, in, in those villages where we where we'd fly into, uh, there, weren't, there weren't very many vehicles and there's a whole lot of uh, walking done, but we, we still collected a lot of material. Then uh, I mentioned the airstrip hopping, these small aircraft, and we would go to these airstrips, buzz the airstrip to run the animals off, and, and by the time we landed, someone from the compound would, the ranch compound would be there to meet us, and we'd collect wild species in that situation. But in the early 80s, we had a colleague uh, and a team from Bolivia that uh, they uh, landed on one that had been taken over by a drug cartel, and they didn't make it out. So we stopped. The, that was our, our last time to do airstrip hopping. We quit that. Then in 
1981. In 1980, Dr. Jose Valls was appointed the peanut and forage grass curator for uh, St. Arzine and Embrapa, and he and I made our first expedition in 1981 to the western Mato Grosso, and this, this was the trek we followed. I broke it down into to red from Brasilia. We drove out to this region. I put this in black. That, that area took us two weeks to get out from Cuyaba to the western frontier. And uh, the, that's the kind of roads. That, that was a good one. Uh, it, was, it was a difficult trip. But, uh, you know, the, uh, we'd get into uh, roads that hadn't been traveled in three or four years and run into this situation. We thought at first we were blocked, but we got out our tools and we actually made a way around that blockage and uh, actually collected a new species just beyond that. So uh, the effort was worth it. Uh, this is a picture of, of one of the good bridges that we crossed. And uh, this is a picture of one that was not so good. I must admit though, of the hundreds of bridges that we've crossed oh, in, in the 40 years, we've made it across all but one. Uh, that one was a problem. But uh, some, of the, some of them didn't have bridges. This is Rio San Francisco at that time. And uh, so we, we used the ferry. That one was interesting because that was a gasoline truck that was leaking. Uh, here, they, they cut this uh, road into the forest and cleared the land and planted some of that uh, 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 nondescript, what was it, uh, rice that uh, is, is, has no inputs. But we also found a, a wild peanut growing in the edge of the woods and in the road and in the rice field. Uh, some of the roads were good in the dry season, but when it rained, uh, you had to have a four-wheel drive to pass through those. Then in the early, 80, early 80s, the Brazilians got a bank from the international, a loan from the International Bank, and they started building highways, and they built highways. And it was really nice. This kind of road, that area that I pointed out, took two weeks. You can make it in a long afternoon now. Uh, this situation here points out the, the critical timing. We crossed this bridge and, and found this ex excavator working on the road, and right here where, by where I was standing to take the picture, we found a, uh, an, an accession of Arrakis Kuamani. This was a new population, not a new species, but a new population for us. Had we been there uh, 30 minutes later, this old boy would have wiped it out, and uh, we wouldn't, would not have found that population. And uh, here, uh, collecting at Rio Benta Gomez, uh, Arrakis Heloides is uh, doing well in the grasses, and that farmer, uh, hopefully he won't kill it to put a herbicide on there to kill that weed that's in his, messing up his grass. But uh, they, I want to point out some places where we've, we've found the wild peanut, Arrakis Kuamani in the road ditch where they'd graded, but they didn't, they didn't uh, get all the seed, and it rained, and there we found a population. This is in, in, during the dry season, some of the conditions where you, you really struggle to find them, but a lot of times you find them growing here, the wild peanut there, and the wild peanut was here, and the wild peanut was there, and this, these leaves of this drying, dried leaves, uh, there was a wild peanut that was growing there, but uh, completely out of moisture, but we did get seed. Um, in the early part of the rainy season, it's easy to find them growing like this before the grasses take over. But then uh, after the grasses start growing, they're a little more difficult. But uh, if you, go, you find that palpinaceous flower, uh, like here, you, you can, you, uh, they're easier, easier to find. But in conditions like this, uh, those are peanut flowers. Uh, they're not hard to find when you find that. Uh, but in the Cerrado, uh, wild peanuts grow in the Cerrado like this, not as abundant as in the previous slide, but uh, they're there. Uh, this trail that we were following, uh, we, we, dis we discussed stopping and going back, but just around that bend, 
uh, we found this population of Rachistemosperma. So, uh, and th this this plant actually was growing in the in the streets of Porto Espedijon in western Brazil. Uh, here we were looking uh, on the top of a mountain down into the Banhadas de Sozog in eastern Bolivia. It's a large swamp that uh, a river runs into it and just spreads out. No place to go except spread out in the swamp. And uh, we got permission to, to go into that region as a national preserve. And just uh, about an hour and a half into it, we found a new species that we named after our colleague uh, Krapovicus, uh, David Williams from ARS at that time, and uh, Israel Vargas from Bolivia. And the commandant that gave us permission sent a lieutenant along to keep track, to watch over, what, make sure we did what we said we were going to do. We also encountered a, a group of Guarani Indian, and uh, uh, this, that's me. <laughs> Uh, that's my little screen. We showed them a herbarium specimen and they knew the wild peanut. They didn't know that it produced fruit. They said it's about two kilometers to the west. It was more like five miles, but uh, we made it. And they were really surprised when we started sifting that little screen I was pointed out. Surprised when they started sifting seed out of it and they wanted to know, was it good to eat? Yes, it's good to eat. And they really took interest then because this was a food source growing in one of those ancient sand dunes that I pointed out. And in that area in the Chaco, in the dry season, uh, food is hard to come by. So they had a new food source that they didn't even know about. This was our camp in, in, encampment at, at that location. Uh, in our collection work, one of my assignments early on and continued was to collect the nodules and put them in these desiccator vials. And uh, when, you when you come back into customs and the customs guy opens that, you better have your paperwork in order because that looks a little suspicious. But uh, those rhizobium sa uh, samples went to NC State University, Dr. Gerald Elkin, and he isolated them and, and purified them and put them on glass beads. So uh, they, they, I think they're still available for us. I know they are. Uh, this is Aurelio Scanini, a botanist, a Paraguayan botanist that worked in Argentina. We made herbarium specimens of all the wild peanuts that we collected. And when he was along, he was the one that did it. Dr. Valls does most of the herbarium when, when, when we're in Brazil. This is David Williams, I pointed out, uh, calibrating his GPS. Uh, 92 was the first time that we were able to use GPS, but our maps that we were using before that time were quite accurate. We've never been more than a minute or so off, but when you're searching a minute, uh, it, sometimes it takes a lot of walking to search a minute. So it helps to have the GPS. Uh, Dr. Viles and I, after uh, we started using GPS, we returned to many of the early sites to document uh, with GPS readings when we, when we could find the population, and sometime uh, we had a struggle in finding them, but uh, we uh, documented what we could. Uh, as mentioned in the introduction, uh, this, these blackened areas are the areas where we have collected. Of course, this in the Andes mostly is cultivated, but the other is cultivated and wild. The, uh, the amount of collection we've made was mentioned in the introduction. I'll not take time to go through that. but. Uh, we'll say more than 75 new species. Uh, the monograph was published in 94, described uh, 69 species, including the cultivated species. Uh, Dr. Valls and I described 11 more in uh, 2005, and he described another one recently. Uh, Dr. Sejo in Argentina has 10 that are 10 new species that are described and ready for publication. Dr. Viles and I have two more that are almost ready and uh, gathering data on eight or nine more, making a, a total of about 100. I, ex I think we'll eventually have 110 to 115 species if we can get those others collected before their soybean field. Uh, now moving on to the uh, taxonomy. There are nine taxonomic sections 
and the most primitive being it down here, uh, the most advanced, and the arachis section is the cultivated section, uh, chromosome number 40, and there are two species there, the cultivated and monticula. There are 30 other species, and I'm going to rush through this pretty quickly because time is of essence. Uh, the, the, the primary uh, thing to look for here is the axonomorphic, axonomorphic root, uh, then uh, the rhizomatosi, uh, three species in, are tetraploid, one species is diploid, and they make rhizomes and no, very little or no fruit. Uh, the procumbentes, uh, diploids, uh, I mean, no, the erectoides, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. Uh, 14 species, all diploids. Uh, that, that's a root system of the erectoides, uh, avoiding drought and fires. And the procumbentes, nine species, all diploids. Uh, here's the characteristics that we look for in that section. The coleoriza, two species, uh, diploid, and that's the range of leaf spot, leaf uh, tissue. And that section has all four flower colors in it. It's the only section that has all four flower colors. Then uh, the triarectoides, uh, the ones I mentioned earlier, there are three of those species, uh, diploids, and the three leaf, three leaflets, uh, extra nervosi, uh, there are ten species, and the, they get their name from the veins on the flower. Uh, the veins on the extra nervosi are on the back side of the standard, not on the front. So it's give it give it that name. And their root system is the tubers are a little bit different as well. And then the heteranthi, uh, six species. These are the the annuals that grow in the northern northeastern part of Brazil, uh, very dry conditions, and when it does rain, they grow quickly, fruit quickly, and then die at the end of the moisture. And uh, then the, the Trisiminati, uh, diploid, one species that is recognized now. Uh, the fruit have three segments instead of two. Uh, we have one more species that we're going to add to that group. Uh, now, uh, on the preservation, this is a rhizomatous, the way we grow them in the greenhouse uh, in pots. Uh, early on, we were growing, for seed increases, we were growing these in the, in, out, in the, out in the field, but uh, we had too much bee cross-pollination. We were, we were getting things mixed up, even though we tried to isolate with sections that wouldn't cross. So we've gone into the greenhouse now. and. Uh, about 65% of the collection produces enough seed to store them and keep them uh, in, in, as seed. The other 35% have to be maintained as live plants. Uh, and we increase them in these half bushel baskets. We grow seed and uh, like this. Uh, the the Valsi species is our, uh, one of our bridge species. Flugi is another and we uh, collected that flugi in 2007, new species in northeast Paraguay, and that was our last material that we could bring out after the biodiversity law uh, agreement uh, that was signed by the Andean PAC nations. Uh, we haven't been able to bring anything out, but I continue to be involved in the collection because if we can get it into uh, collections down there in Brazil, Argentina, eventually I hope we can uh, get things solved and get them into the U.S. Uh, the cross that formed the cultivated peanut by molecular analysis is proven to be Duranensis and Epansis. Uh, two diploids, uh, a, a genome and B genome, and the molecular people tell us that the, the Epansis had to be the had to be the male, and Duranensis had to be the female. Uh, with an A, a parachromosome, small parachromosomes. The problem is we cannot make the cross that direction. We can make the cross with the epensis as the male, as the female, but not as the male. Uh, I'm working on that. I, th I think I'll solve it too. I keep. I, I hope so. Uh, the first cross that I made was 1968, and just fortuitously I brought, I uh, used Durinensis, 
uh, with a cultivated peanut, got a triploid, and of course, my Saturday night's training, the triploid's gonna be sterile, but that's the silly thing made seed. Uh, I'm still trying to explain that, but uh, I've published a couple of papers on it, but I'm still working on it. Uh, I've spent most of my time uh, making crosses, looking for cross compatibility, and I use pollen grain uh, staining as an estimate of fertility, as uh, studying the relationship between one that we, a new one that we might have collected and the older things that we, and these, these are the pollen count numbers in that cross. And this, that one was done before we had names on most of it. Uh, then this one's more recent, uh, new material collected and the names applied are still the same structure. There's still some uh, problems with no flowers with some of these crosses. Uh, I mentioned Arrakis diagoi, a yellow and orange flower. Uh, in the early part of my career, that was identified, not by us, by another team, that was resistant to early leaf spot. Leaf spot is the, mo the most devastating disease of the peanut worldwide. And early and a late that can occur together or separately. A Cardinaceae was identified as being almost immune to late leaf spot. And uh, so I started a, a crossing program to, uh, using the triploid route and uh, going to hexaploids. And I did that with both Diagoi and Cardinaceae. And, and uh, I was running into a lot of problems. There were two other uh, programs in the world, one in Icrosat and one in NC State that were doing the same thing. So I decided to go to the diploid route and uh, used Cardinaceae and Diagoi, but that uh, ran into a lot of sterility there. About that time, it was published that Batiza Koi was, uh, the, did not have the A pair of chromosomes, so I said, well, maybe it was the donor. So I used that, and sure enough, I got uh, uh, a uh, tetraploid that we released as Texag-6, crossed it with Hypogea, and the first back cross, we, we released Texag-7. Uh, that was on, uh, on our way. Well, here's the pods of the, that, those two. Uh, we were in a leaf spot uh, resistant program. After the fourth back cross, we went to the field, made selections, and uh, this was the kind of material that we were having. This is a, uh, we also transferred in that same cross rust resistance. Uh, in 1986, we found and there were several species that we found that had root knot nematode resistance. And uh, lo and behold, one of them was what we were using in the leaf spot program, Arrakis cardinaceae. We were in the eighth back cross generation, so we started our work way back, but we had to go all the way back to the, to the first back cross that we had already transferred the nematode resistance into a cross compatible cultivated line. And we released the first variety, and that was on the, crop, on the cover of Crop Science, and I was right proud of that, to get that on the cover of Crop Science. Uh, the resistant line with the susceptible lines, and this is under heavy nematode pressure. And then our second variety, Nematam. Uh, another thing that we worked on, uh, we especially got started on this when uh, the oil prices got, uh, diesel prices got up over four gallon, four dollars a gallon, and there are cultivated varieties that have 43 to 51 percent, uh, section Arrakis 32 to 55, and the Rectoides section up to 64 percent. And some of our crosses, we got up to 54, 62 percent, and intersectional some to 70, 64 percent. And that material came from right in the heart of where we think the uh, origin of the of the genus is from, but uh, another thing that we found was that this wasn't with the wild species. This was cultivated material. Uh, tomato spotted wilt resistance transferred uh, uh, into a variety released as Tamron 96. This saved the peanut industry in the south part of Texas uh, at that time, and that came from northeast uh, Bolivia. 
uh, at Wajah Marine, and that same line also had resistance to uh, sclerotinia. Sclerotinia is a devastating disease, and this was a, a nursery where we were screening. Uh, another thing we're looking at is early maturity, Arrakis precoce. This, this line, th this wild species grows at the end of the wet season as the water recedes. It, it germinates, grows a plant, flowers and fruits, and dies in 45 days. We think maybe it may have uh, some earliness because the, the cultivated crop takes about 120 to 160 days. And uh, I can't spend a lot of time here, I'm about out of time, but uh, the problem with Arrakis precoce, it, it has, it's missing two chromosomes, it only has 18. And we ran into a, a total sterility when we got in to this stage here. Uh, the high oleic trait is something that is really important to the peanut. Uh, this slide doesn't show very well, but uh, olive oil is high oleic, low linoleic, and some of our materials, this is uh, information that came out of it, was released by the University of Florida, and we're use it under a license, but uh, almost as good as olive oil as a peanut. Uh, the oil in the peanut. Uh, other integration progress programs, we're working, we're in the middle of a southern blight, sclerosium rhosii resistance, and drought tolerance is a big issue right now, and uh, that's, that is, will be important in the future, and uh, I have a PhD student, John Kaysen, that he would be here at this meeting, but uh, he's, he's doing some uh, RNA uh, going to do some RNA extraction and some of his plants are ready to be sampled this week in a stress test and uh, so he felt it was more important that he tend to his PhD research than come here. I, I, I guess I can understand that. Uh, but that's a couple of shots from some of his plants. Uh, I came from forage grass breeding uh, in my master's and PhD research and one of the things in Apomixis, when you see twin seedlings, you automatically think of uh, Apomixis. Well, when I started to work with peanuts, I started seeing uh, twin seedlings. I thought, not really. Well, having done, we, this was old school, uh, did sectioning of ovules, and sure enough, when you withhold pollination or pollinate with a foreign pollen, you get breakdown of the sexual tissue and development of new cellar cells into embryo sacs and embryos. So Apomixis does exist in the, in the leguminosae in the Arrakis. I tried to get that published at some different journals and they said, editor said, no, uh, you're way out on a limb that's gonna get chopped off. Uh, Apomixis does not occur in the uh, leguminosae. I finally got that published in a SEAT publication in a workshop and so now I can refer to it as published information that's available, public. I think with molecular analysis, that would be a very good study for some, somebody to, if, if someone had the money to do it uh, for a career. And of course, we're working with Dr. Mark Burr in Lubbock as a molecular breeder. And uh, I don't do molecular because I don't know how, but uh, uh, molecular analysis is going to be very important in the future. I have no problems with doing it for people that know how to do it. And so move on. Uh, in conclusion, we have a vast amount of genetic diversity in the wild arachis germplasm, much of which is accessible through conventional breeding, if you want to call doubling chromosomes of conventional breeding, but the, the molecular techniques and tools will be very important in the integration in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. At this time, we'll take any questions. There's one here. Thank you. Um, so with all of the different species of wild peanut that there are, 
and and you mentioned that they were edible. Is there any evidence that there were other peanuts that were partially domesticated in the past? That's one of the things I had to take out of the talk. When I was invited to do this, I started accumulating slides and everything that I wanted to talk about. And when I put it all together and went through it the first time, it was more than twice of the time limit. So I had to start slash and burn, as Dr. Gibbs said to do. And that was one of the things that I had to take out. Yes, uh, the Arrakis stenosperma, the Arrakis villasulacarpa, and at least two other species we know, uh, well, the, the, the villasulacarpa is still cultivated on the reservations in, Brazil, in western Brazil. Stenosperma was, we know, was taken that, that band on the southeast coast of Brazil. Those, were, those peanuts were taken there by hunters and gatherers from the western part of the, of the continent that would come across. And that, that hunting expedition was not overnight. I mean, they, they spent some time. But the shell mounds in the two locations verified that they were the same groups. But they found that wild peanut in the central Mato Grosso, and they took it with them. And they spread that thing in several different places where there were those eroded hills that I pointed out. There'd be a cave dug out, a lookout cave in the, in the top. And a while, uh, stenosperma would be growing around the base for food. So yes, there there are several instances where they were used for food. And those Guarani Indians, they were terribly excited about having that possibility. I, I have a question for you. Um, <clears throat> in your presentation, taking these wild species and deriving the things that you did that moved into the cultivated species, the graphs made it look easy. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I, I want I want the group, the students to, because cytogenetics has become a lost art in 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 a lot of what we do, and so I, I think it would be useful for you to take a few minutes and describe what you had to do to make these things happen. They didn't just you didn't just make the cross, did you? Well, the first cross that uh, between. Uh, between Cardenasia and Diagoi, I made 3,500 pollinations and got one seed. I don't know whether that's persistence or idiocy. <laughs> one or the other. But we accomplished the cross because I knew from the literature that the cross had been made previously, several, several decades before, but the, the hybrid had been lost. So I knew the cross would go. Now, ironically enough, I learned a new crossing technique from my student from Senegal a number of years ago. And using his technique, I made five pollinations and got two seed. I wish I'd have had that student early on. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, do you have any species of peanuts that are used for forage? Yes. The, the rhizomatous that I showed the picture of and the coleoriza. There, there are varieties of the rhizomatosi. Uh, Florida has released, I've forgotten, five or six or seven varieties of glabrata uh, as forage plants. My colleague uh, at, at Stephenville took one of our lines and uh, found that it had cold tolerance. And since I'd had some experience in writing up variety releases, he asked me to participate and help him make sure he got everything right. And uh, so I've actually got my name on a, on a variety of forage peanuts. <laughs> released. We call it Latitude 34 because it will survive up to Latitude 34 on the north side. Uh, Pintoi is a coleoriza species that there are several several releases of that. The most, the most notable is uh, Amarillo released by the people in Australia, but it's growing in many, many places in South America. 
Okay. Charlie, have you run across any species that do not contain the protein that so many people are allergic to? There, there have been, well, I think there, are, there may be more now, this may be ancient information, but to my knowledge there are four species, five, species, five uh, amino acids involved in the allergy. And there have been three of those identified as missing in wild species. There may be the other two somewhere. So the, the, there exists the possibility of eliminating uh, through, through genetics. Uh, don't know what, the, what, the, what it's going to taste like. That's, that's the thing that concerns me about inserting genes and things like that. Or you, you've got a block of genes that makes it taste like a peanut. You stick a disease resistance gene in the middle of it. <laughs> and I may explain, I may said more than I should have about what I know about molecular genetics. But anyway, I, that's, that's one of my concerns. More? OK. Bill and I uh, looked at the greenhouses and the lab, and they told me that this is where the largest collection of wild arachis exists in the world. So that's a big thing for Stephenville. Um, now, what makes a species a species in arachis, and is hypogee the only, you know, commercially available peanuts, or what? What makes a species? Because you have too many species here that you described, so. I mean, that's too many species for one genus. So what makes a species a species? Not only ploidy level, not only chromosome number, not only number of genomes, apparently. So there has, there has to be some, I mean, something more than that to it. Well, when I started to work, it was primarily morphology and then introduction of cross compatibility. But now we have the molecular tools and that is, is another tool to say, okay, these are different. Uh, they're not different. But to, to us, that, the ones that have described the species, and, and I was involved in, in eight of the, of the six, 69, uh, my name is on eight of them because I provided cross compatibility data to them and so I was a co-author on those. But uh, we're now using some molecular analysis to make, to decide. But uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure I have a real good answer for you other than morpho if, if I can tell the difference morphologically. And I started out this, this work as a total agronomist. But over the years working with Viles, Dr. Viles and Dr. Krapovikas, I became somewhat of a botanist. And a flat, dried specimen has a lot more meaning to me now than it did early on. I look at those flat specimens, I, 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 I can't tell anything about that. Give me a plant. So that made us a, a fairly good team because they were, they're botanists uh, at least Krapovikas, the botanist, and he was looking at plants everywhere, and I was looking at the ground. So uh, he he would find things that I wouldn't find, and I would find things that he wouldn't find. But to to say what is a species, uh, I think if you ask uh, 500 botanists, uh, you might get 400 answers. You might get 500 answers. I'm not sure. That's that's a that's a difficult question to answer. Charles, back here. Has anything uh, significant come out of the rhizobia collections? Uh, the only the only one that I know for sure is Icarset took one that was collected at Saavedra uh, Experiment Station in in uh, Bolivia, and it was taken to Icarset. And they used it on one of their common varieties, and I've, I've forgotten now which which variety it was. But it they in a, in the a replicated test, they said they got a 65% increase in production. Now I haven't seen a lot of follow-up to that, but that was 
that, that's the only one that I know of. Uh, I've used some soil that I brought back early on uh, for the coleoriza because the coleoriza seemed to have a different strain of rhizobia. And I, I brought some soil back and, and grew the plants and they did a lot better. And I also got some of the, from that same accession, some of the rhizobium from Dr. Elkins. And the, the plants were a lot greener, but uh, I didn't do a whole lot with it. I, I didn't have the wherewithal to do it. So to answer your question, not a lot has been done that I'm aware of. Well, take that back. I just remembered. Uh, until he retired, one of, the, one of the men that worked with Nitrogen Company, <clears throat> anytime I needed a bag of rhizobium, of, of inoculum, all I had to do was pick up the phone and call him because he, he disclosed to me one time of, of the five strains in their peanut inoculum, three of them were from that source. Now I'd forgotten about that. Awesome. That is all the time we have for questions, but once again, let's thank Dr. Simpson for his great presentation. Thank you. All right.